Hello, welcome to Speech Talk Live. This is episode number 10. This is today's August uh, 7th, I believe. August 7th, right, August 7th, 2015. And my name is Jay Oza, and I host this show that we do on a weekly basis. And as you can see, we're now up to episode 10, so we would like what you think of this show. And uh, I do three things. One thing I do is I, I have my own uh, small consulting practice. I work with uh, mostly small businesses and startups, helping them generate sales, uh, in, mostly in the high tech area. Uh, the second thing I do is uh, I'm actually also writing a book on public speaking, uh, primarily like how do you get people to develop the skill uh, outside the course. That seems to be the problem that I've been noticing. So I'm working on this book and if you're interested, uh, I can send you a copy as a draft when it's completed. And the third thing obviously is this course, uh, the show that we do, Speech Talk Live. And I enjoy this thing. We learn a lot. I learn a lot. Uh, I get to interact with some outstanding people who participate. And also it's an opportunity for us to create a lot of content that others can then use any way they want to, whether to learn, whether to provide us feedback or whatever. So if you're watching this, this is the 10th episode. There's a lot of interesting topics that we have done already that I strongly urge you to take a look at. And you will learn a lot. In fact, when I went back to it, I learned quite a bit just uh, watching this. The reason uh, I do this uh, show is for four reasons. One is to learn, and public speaking is hard. You know, I've been doing this for quite some time, but it's still hard. There's a lot of fear in speaking, and that's natural. And the only way you improve is by doing it. So I'm constantly learning. Learning is a key thing. The second aspect is to teach. I think by teaching what I know, it makes me a better speaker. So that's one of the thing, important things of doing this show, that people who participate have certain level of ability where they're not only learning, but they're also teaching others. So that's a very important aspect of uh, this, uh, uh, this, this show. The third is to share. And here today I'm sharing one of my speech that I had done a while back and I would like to get some feedback from others. But obviously if you're watching this, the only way you're going to improve is by recording your speech. Once you think you cannot, you need some real feedback to get to that next level. That's when you want to record it and share it with us and we can provide your feedback and as a way to teach others. And the fourth thing I think is very important. This is a support uh, group. We want to support each other. This is a place where when you give a speech and if it doesn't uh, come across as the way you want it to, it, you're not going to lose your job. You're not going to, it's not going to affect you in any way. It's a low stakes or no stakes environment. When you're out there at a high stakes environment where it does matter, you want to test it here first before you go and test it somewhere else, before you try it, before you, you know, use it somewhere else. So this is a good way to really practice in a very support environment. So that's about it. Uh, today's uh, show, we have three segments. Uh, the first segment is going to be facilitated by Somian uh, Thirumurthy. And he's picked an interesting topic, which I think uh, we're going to have a nice discussion around on gestures. I think he's going to focus, I don't know at this point what he's going to focus on, whether it's body language or just the hand gestures. He can, uh, when he does the segment, he'll be able to explain to us uh, what exactly his topic that he has chosen that he feels that other people need to uh, uh, pay attention to, uh, to become a more effective speaker. The second segment, as I mentioned, is uh, one of my speeches that I had recorded uh, when I took this uh, uh, Coursera course called Introduction to Public Speaking. And this is an informative speech, and it deals with uh, data and the privacy issue when companies have access to data that they're uh, accumulating from your purchases or uh, your online activities or whatever that you're filling out. So that could be an interesting topic. I'd like to get feedback uh, from from Somian to see what he thought of that speech and if there's anything I could have done better. Uh, and the last uh, segment is he, we're going to look at a really outstanding speech that was given by uh, an Indian uh, uh, politician. Uh, he's, I think he may not be anymore, but he's a member of parliament. His name is Shashi Tharoor. He's quite well known in the Indian 
a community. He used to, I think, work in the United Nations. I've seen him at the UN. And then he went back and became the member of parliament, which is equivalent to our, in the United States, our Congress. And he's given the speech about, uh, it's an interesting speech, uh, somewhat academic about uh, whether Britain should pay, it's an argument he's making, you know, whether the Britain rule of India, was that a good thing or bad thing? If it was a bad thing, should there be a reparations paid? So we'll have a nice discussion around that. So I hope you enjoyed the show. And again, uh, if you have any comments or suggestions on how we can make this better, please let us know because we want to keep making this better so that it adds value to you. So at this point, I'm going to have Somian introduce himself and then we'll get started with our first segment. Okay, Somian, go ahead. Okay. Hi, everybody. My name is Somian. I am from uh, Bangalore in India. Uh, Bangalore is in the southern part of India and it is uh, known as a Silicon City here. Yeah, Sil it's a Silicon Valley of India. Uh, that means uh, we have a lot of computer industry and uh, software industry here. That's true. And I work for a computer peripheral industry in uh, Bangalore. Uh, well, I mean, uh, I'm uh, 67 years old and I retired about seven years back. And ever since uh, I've been mixing a little bit of uh, consultancy and uh, some amount of uh, voluntary work. Among the voluntary activities, I have two. Uh, one is uh, uh, as a Wikimedia promoter or, uh, uh, from the Wikimedia movement. I've been an official also for some two years. And uh, I relinquished that post also about a year and a half back. And ever since I've been a volunteer there. And the other activity, voluntary activity, is this uh, mentorship in uh, Coursera. Uh, I have, uh, of course, uh, taken some more courses in Coursera also, mostly around thinking processes and uh, uh, such as uh, model thinking, mathematical thinking, logical thinking, uh, and uh, you know, critical thinking, and so on. The other kind of uh, uh, activities have been on uh, communication, which included the English composition as well as uh, public speaking. Okay, so there are other courses which are not relevant for this particular uh, discussion, so we will not uh, get deeper into that. Uh, so my topic for today is going to be on, uh, uh, you know, public speaking tip, using appropriate hand gestures during a speech. That's what I'm going to talk about. So uh, I would like to now uh, hand it back to Ajay before I continue. Jay? Okay, so I mean, thanks a lot. So I'm going to take a quick break, and I do this so that uh, when I cut this piece, it comes across like uh, seamlessly. So I'm going to take a couple of second break, and then I'll introduce our segment number one, okay? Okay, welcome to Speech Talk Live, episode number 10. My name is Jay Oza. I'm the host of uh, Speech Talk Live, and we are going to move to segment number one. And segment number one will be facilitated by Somyan uh, Thirumurthy based out of Bangalore, India. And he also, uh, besides other things, uh, is a mentor for this uh, introduction to public speaking course uh, offered by Coursera. And he's going to talk about uh, a topic that he's picked, uh, something that I think he's going to go into it on why he's picked it. He's going to explain it on hand gestures. What are the appropriate hand gestures to use? And hand gestures are very important when you're giving a speech. And then after he introduces this, we'll have a, a discussion around it. So at this point, I'm going to turn this over to Somyan to take it over and uh, give us some idea what kind of hand gestures we should be using. Thank you, Jay. Uh, let me straight away get started. Uh, well, all of you know I am Sogne. Um This topic on hand gestures is something that uh, has been uh, buzzing in my mind for quite some time. Uh, when we went through this uh, course, Professor uh, Matt McGarity was uh, talking about hand gestures uh, in a very brief uh, video. He's, he covered it in about half of one video. Okay. So I used to think that maybe there must be a lot more to hand gestures and think that, and perhaps because of the voluminous amount of information that may be there, uh, he has uh, considered this as uh, to, to some extent out of the scope. And uh, you know, uh, that's the way he has treated it. So I was always curious to know uh, what more is there uh, related to hand gestures. After all, you know, in, in my native language, Tamil, if I look at it, uh, the language is treated to three parts. We say prose, poetry, and dialogue. Okay, prose is a, a text, you know, which is grammatically going to be right, etc. Poetry, we do take a little bit of liberty. We, we look for a rhyme and rhythm and things like that. So to that extent, some uh, jugglery of words has been done. 
and then dialogue is something which is uh, spoken uh, language which is not going to be very highly grammatical etc and so that is going to be lot more uh, you know uh, communication oriented style short brief uh, phrases and so on and so forth you are not going to have too much of a um, grammar, grammar etc there so uh, then if i look at speech public speaking seems to come as a derivative from the dialogue process and not really from the prose process if you take poetry poetry moved on to singing and then went on to also you know combine body language and became drama i mean sorry dance whereas uh, from dialogue we can say we can move on to uh, uh, speech public speech and then further by adding more of uh, uh, you know body language we can move to drama really so it is somewhere between drama and uh, uh, you know uh, dialogue so maybe definitely dramas must have lot of uh, theory on body language and things like that and how much is uh, appropriate for uh, public speaking and why are this, they not being taught uh, adequately so that's what i used to uh, wonder after all uh, the, there are directors and they have a, a way of defining how an actor should uh, show body language okay so there is theory but how much is appropriate here what is relevant here this used to be my uh, point of uh, you know uh, thinking uh well um what are the, i mean what did professor megarity say during his lecture in that half a video that i talked about what has he uh, talked of he didn't emphasize too much on i mean on hand gestures he certainly said that you know there will be nervous energy in our body and that will typically show through the inappropriate hand gestures etc and we need to be able to reduce the display of that tension nervousness and things like so it it was more of a negative objective don't show your nervousness okay second he suggested having a dialogue box i mean sorry a gesture box in front of us you know from uh, somewhere from our uh, uh, eye level to uh, somewhere up to our chest level uh, to the extent our arms can stretch in that space you make all your gestures don't try to make it you know close up your thighs and or you know much above your head and so on so on so he placed a certain uh, a zone in which you show most of your gestures then third thing is that is make whatever gesture that comes naturally to you don't really bother too much about uh, you know what is the appropriate gesture you really may not be you know controlling our, our gesture as much you know it something that comes out much more naturally okay uh, there is very little we may be able to do it but there was a emphasis that watch your videos and try and avoid whatever is negative whatever is distracting whatever is undesirable this is what he was saying well i mean uh, that much i could understand but then i was still wondering whether there is something more to it and the, you know whether the uh, the field of uh, cinematography and you know that thing like they, they are going to bring in lot more of it so that's what i was uh, looking for okay so um, then let me now look at i just now described what professor magarity talked about let me say what is it the audience to convey They, uh, all the people participants in the discussion forum they have been uh, you know expressing their views what do they say practically every review of a popular speaker that was there in the uh, as part of the course was something that people have commented upon and most of them made an observation about body language made an observation about hand gestures okay so but however uh, you know nowhere was there a outstanding hand gesture or something like that people could recognize they could recognize something that was distracting something that was bad something that is not desirable but there is nothing as a example of outstanding hand gestures okay so that kind of thing didn't arise the same thing happened with uh, you know the peer review situation also there is a single guy whose hand gestures stood out in such a way that we could say here here is a you know a, a master of hand gestures you know we could not say that but we could definitely identify these guys had a very very bad hand gesture their, their hand gestures were distracting so it looks at the end of the, all this uh, study it looked as if you know there is nothing that you can say as a positive but you you have a lot that you have to avoid which is negative so that is what say, seems to come through this is precisely what professor megarity also was saying and i was trying to make i mean uh, correlate my observations with what he was saying and this is what came out now i wanted to also see what does the world say about it i went and done a search for uh, hand gestures in the uh, on youtube and uh, generally uh, uh, googled for it and uh, looked at many resources both text and uh, video i mean videos 
I picked up some top five videos from this and posted it on uh, the, the Google Communities forum, where you know we are talking about uh, uh, introduction to public speaking. In that forum, I posted that. Uh, well, I mean, they, 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 it's, it was it is interesting that the five videos emphasized on five different aspects, and even though they had some kind of commonality, they also were showing different uh, facets of this. So that is interesting. I would urge all of you to go and watch those things. I'm not going to describe every one of them. I'm going to only narrate some takeaways from that. What I found from this is there is no science based on gestures that has to be learned and followed. Okay, everybody is keeps, keeps on saying that, look, you can have uh, a practice, you can do a natural hand gesture. There may be some bad uh, postures and bad gestures, etc. You identify them and eliminate them. So in your peer review process, you need to say what kind of a distracting bad habits you have got in terms of gestures and try to uh, screen them out. That's the focus. Rather say, look, this is an appropriate gesture, use it in this forum. And there is also emphasis saying like that, look, don't keep on repeating the same hand gesture over and over again. That could be also a distracting factor. Well, I remember in my college days, one of our chemistry professors used to, you know, always make a gesture. He will hold a, a cup to hand. He will say one ingredient will be added, yet another ingredient you bring in that, and you go and stir. Okay, mix. So he used to mix so many chemicals in this kind of formation and rub them on his palm that we used to joke, say that, look, very soon you will get a hole in the palm. Okay, so that kind of thing. So it can be highly distracting when some of these kind of, uh, uh, you know, um, um, hand washes are done. Uh, somebody starts counting how many times did he uh, you know rub this way he, the guys are not focusing on uh, learning a lesson and then they know they start uh, counting on these kind of trivial things this, this this is a classic case of distraction that can happen so repeating something is also not a good thing so you can avoid that now uh, just a minute Okay, so uh, that, that's a key uh, aspect. Then I, I was trying to look for something which is more of a, a, a positive suggestion than say, uh, rather than saying, don't do this. Okay, so don't do this seems to be very simple to talk about, but I was looking for something which is positive. Okay. Sorry about this. Okay, so uh, there are uh, some suggestions. Uh, th there is a video clip from uh, Toastmasters. Uh, now they don't really say that uh, uh, you can do this. They are sort of trying to classify hand gestures into some four categories. First category they seem to identify is uh, you can uh, have some descriptive gestures, something that says something is small, something is big, large, tall, short, those kind of uh, things you can express by hand. Something is a square, cube, okay, circular. Those kind of uh, gestures can be shown. So that is one kind of uh, thing. You can even count one, two, three, etc. The other kind of gesture is emphasis. Sometimes you know we may uh, you know uh, hold a cl clenched fist and show anger by banging it on another palm and say that, how can this happen? Okay, those are the kind of, uh, uh, some of the simple things that one can do. The third one can be some, uh, you know, suggestive gestures. You can shrug your shoulders and say, look, what can I do? Or you can show some facial expressions, etc. Okay, so you may even say uh, thumbs up or thumbs down. Those kind of things are stop. Those are the kind of things we can do. Those are uh, some of these uh, uh, gestures. Uh, and the last one is uh, gestures related to prompting. Suppose you want to invite your audience to say, look, how many of you agree with me? Raise your hands. Okay. You are trying to invite them to give a feedback by raising your hands. You are also prompting them to raise their hands. Okay. This is a prompting gesture. So these are the four types of gestures that are talked about. However, they also say, look, don't overdo these gestures. Do whatever comes naturally to you. And these are just classifications and types to understand in what context people use it. Don't try to stuff your uh, you know, speech with all this kind of uh, art, uh, artificial gestures. You will never be able to uh, you know, have adequate amount of control on these things. And so make sure that you understand what these gestures are about to think about it. But just do a moderate degree of hand gesture. 
doing less hand gestures may not be as distracting as making excessive amount of uh, ir irrelevant gestures people emphasize you must do a purposeful gesture that is what they keep saying again and again so this is uh, what i found as uh, you know what the world says about uh, hand gestures okay there is a lot more of emphasis on body language other things like you know movement and uh, you know uh, eye contact eye contact is very heavily emphasized movement is uh, uh, something that people are looking at with caution movement apparently is the next stage once you have mastered your hand gesture you can move around the stage moving around the stage jumping around the stage could be seen as uh, yeah say a sign of uh, uh, you know nervousness so maybe in the initial stage it takes uh, it's a good uh, a good thing for us to go and stay some place use some maybe some four or five feet of uh, space to go around and move that uh, even within that move purposefully rather than you know aimlessly keep uh, you know swaying to the left or right etc not make these kind of uh, uh, you know body gestures see the moment you make action action speaks louder than word this is one proverb that is there so when we are making some action you no know, our hand or something like that moves our body moves there is a lot more attention that that attracts than the speech that goes into your, uh, our ears okay so it is better to moderate this let the action not be a distraction let it not you no know, overtake what what you are trying to communicate so that is what is being emphasized in all the uh, videos so this is what i took away from these things okay so i think uh, uh, at the uh, at the end of it the bottom line is what our professor uh, uh, matt mcgarity uh, talked about in the video lectures was uh, all that you have to do you don't have to really do much as a new hand gesture act naturally do uh, what comes to you very naturally have this uh, you know gesture box in which you do it don't do it outside too much outside this gesture box limit your hand gestures within it make a gentle approach have some uh, open palms and the clad so, which is inviting that kind of a thing there is more emphasis to be placed on what is to be avoided have a review and anything that is distracting please avoid that and you know you show your confidence and uh, things like that but through your posture so that is the uh, primary takeaway okay so this is what i have uh, uh, garnered by uh, investigating a lot more into hand gestures as a uh, topic uh, definitely it doesn't seem to go all the way towards uh, cinematography and uh, uh, you know movie direction and things like in public speaking there is always a emphasis on moderating these hand gestures and making them relevant to the context so that's what it is thank you yeah <clears throat> that was excellent yeah i i i i i completely agree and uh, let me just stand because uh, I'll, I'll sometimes you have to stand to make it uh, so one of the things uh, hand gestures are very interesting topic uh, there was a, a woman who did some sort of a, a research and uh, what she found was uh, she looked at the ted talk speakers her name i'll i'll, I'll include the link uh, her name is uh, vanessa van edwards and she studies body language uh, she's got some sort of a, a, a like a lab she has set up called science of people where she studies body language and she did some sort of a research for ted talks and what she found was that on average the, the at the bottom end she said was uh, 272 like you know ted speeches are about 15 minutes long just only 15 to 18 minutes long was she she basically found 272 gestures that's at the bottom level some of the top speeches like simon sinek and uh, temple grandin that went all the way up to 600 so hand gestures are very important if you are for for in a speech and one of the things that that i recommend <clears throat> like one thing that somian said makes is very important just don't wildly use hand gestures because it can be very distracting but like if i just go like this i mean if i just start doing things that are not consistent with what i'm saying then it's going to be distracting but if it is very consistent with the point that i'm making then the hand gestures is essentially communicating a message that i'm trying to convey and there are certain like i was watching there had a debate here in the united states you know we we have a presidential election there is a candidate named donald trump and it was interesting this guy is a businessman real macho type every time there was a question asked 
his his initial before the the moderator finished the question, he would always his this was his hand gesture. Every question he would start out like that. Now, like I don't know. The way I interpret that hand, remember, he hasn't even said anything, but the question is being asked and he would be like, 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 okay, so what's the big deal? Like, like, what's the big deal? That's how I'm interpreting it. Like, he's not saying that. He's just like, like, okay, so like, like, what's the big deal about that? Right. And he's giving out, he's communicating with that hand gesture. Like, hey, I'm businessman. Like, why are you even asking me this question? Like, like, what's, what's the big deal about this? And he's communicating a lot. Uh, one of the other things I'll point out to people is that when you are giving a speech, always be welcoming. This is a very good hand gesture, palms open. One thing that people say you should avoid, even though it's, I noticed it in the debate last night that some people, it's hard to avoid, is this. Like, even if you are making, people do not like to be pointed at, okay? Even though you're harmless, but if I just say, hey, you better listen to my point. What I'm telling you is really important, right? And immediately you're going to get like, wait a second, why is he pointing at me? You know. So avoid that. One of the things that somebody coached Bill Clinton, he used to do that, and they said instead of that, use this. Like so, he would take a thumb and then just go like that. Hey, I want to make a point. And then if you notice Bill Clinton, he'll never do this. He'll always. That's hard. It's, it's, it's when you're giving a speech. Sometimes you're not going to be able to control your hand gestures. So the best way is what I'm doing right now. I'm looking at myself and I'm watching my hand gestures. Now, right now I'm on a camera and I can see. But the best thing to do is record your video and look at the hand gestures. Are your hand gestures way out of line? Is it helping you communicate or is it de detracting from your message? And if it's communicating, then make sure you use the hand gestures. If it's getting in the way of conveying your message, then change it. Because when somebody is going to see you, they're going to notice the hand gestures. They're going to pay more attention to your hand gestures than what you're saying. So uh, hand gestures is extremely important. And I'll, I'll give you some additional information here. Uh, according to that research, they found that it's not what you say, but how you say it. And the key thing, the message that this uh, this woman pointed out was that you have to focus on your nonverbal just as much as your verbal. So hand gestures are very important. You really have to integrate it with what you're saying. And if you're if you're just focusing on your verbal and not focusing on your nonverbal, remember when you're speaking, you're 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 occupying a stage. You're in a leadership role, and people are able to process more by what you're not saying. So hand gestures become extremely important, just like the voice. And before you even get to the message, people have already made a decision on what your speech is going, whether they're going to like your speech, and that happens very quickly, very early on. That's, I think we had discussed it in one of the session in the first seven seconds. So. You really, so the, to close this out before I hand it over to Samin is record your speech and see what kind of hand gestures you're using and ask people, what do you think? Just ask somebody to just focus on the hand gestures part only because that's what your audience is going to notice first before you even get to your message. A any closing thoughts on that? Uh, those are uh, good points, uh, Jay. I uh, definitely uh, think that uh, these are uh, important issues. Uh, I also uh, uh, watched that particular uh, video that you are talking of, the one who has uh, studied the TED Talks and things like uh, Yes, that uh, welcoming hand gesture, the open arms and things like are uh, emphasized by most of the other uh, articles also. So uh, it looks like, you know, the, the uh, body language becomes a little dominant in terms of perception. Now we don't want that to become so dominant. Otherwise, you know, we would perhaps be preferring the drama type of uh, you know communication. 
where body language really becomes highly dominant. Here, we don't want body language to dominate so much. We want a more uh, focus to be on the content. So there is a, a lot of suggestion, moderation. Body language that way seems to be fairly strong. It gives a lot of subtle cues. In fact, there is one uh, article I was trying to look for. They say they, 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 somebody has uh, gone to do a research to try and trace where did this uh, you know, hand gesture as a uh, attribute coming. So they went in to uh, you know, investigate uh, um, up the genealogical tree and they went right up to the fish stage. You know, it seems the fish, when they have when they flap their uh, uh, fins, they actually are doing a, a non-verbal communication. Okay, so it seems that is where the the trait of uh, you know making gestures came to uh, uh, you know for, for that, that's the uh, origin of uh, uh, you know the trait of uh, making gestures, and that is what seems to have come to the right up to the human stage. So that is uh, one of the <laughs> theories that is going around. Okay. Okay, I think we're pretty much uh, done with this segment, so I'm going to take a short pause. And again, to close it out, uh, work on the hand gestures, uh, because if you're not noticing it, your audience is going to notice it. So, like I said, the best thing to do is record your video and then look for the hand gestures. That's what I do, like, like you know, when I'm when we're recording this, when we go and when I watch it, I'll look and say, my God, that hand gesture made no sense. So, pay particular attention to the hand gestures you're using and work on it like it is a speech hand gestures should be integrated like a speech like like a message what is the hand gesture message you want to convey once you have that message because sometimes that is going to communicate more anyway I'm exaggerating here but it's this is a way you start practicing it so that it becomes natural all right I'm going to take a brief pause and then we'll start segment two okay Okay, welcome to Speech Talk Live. This is episode number 10. My name is Jay Oza, and we're moving to segment number two. And in this segment, we are going to review a speech. In this case, it's my speech that I had recorded for this uh, Introduction to Public Speaking course. And this is a, an informative speech. And the, the, in, the information that I'm trying to uh, inform others uh, has to do with uh, data. Uh, how companies, first of all, why companies want to collect data. And then how are they collecting data? And what do they do with this? Like what kind of information are they able to gather from the data? And why data has become so important to companies as some people have called it, uh, I don't know if it was Gartner, but the data is the oil of our generation because there is a lot of uh, uh, hidden asset, hidden value in the data uh, that uh, companies uh, are sitting on and they want to collect more and more. And what makes this possible is that, you know, memory is free, not free, it's very cheap. Memory is pretty much inexpensive. So the companies can collect a lot of data and then today with uh, powerful computers uh, and also uh, a a algorithms, sophisticated analytical algorithms, they are able to derive a lot of interesting information, insight from the data that they, that they are collecting. Uh, so this talk that I, I give here, so let me just give you a little overview. Uh, it's about it focuses on, I kept the focus to just one particular example, and it has to do with, it's kind of a dated example, but you may have come across this somewhere else. Uh, it has to do with Target. Uh, it's a big retailer, uh, like Walmart. And uh, they evidently sent some information about uh, baby products to this young woman, and uh, the father evidently got ticked off saying, you know, why am I getting, why is my daughter getting all that? You know, she's a teenager. And he, according to the story, he goes and confronts uh, the manager nearby at the Target, uh, Minneapolis, and says, you know, why are you sending? He didn't know. As it turns out, the marketing department was, was doing it. And as it turned out, that based on her shopping habits, they had figured out that most likely this young woman was, probability was very high that she was 
pregnant. And indeed she was. But that raises a lot of issues on privacy issues. And also, uh, this was a, a topic that Latesh kind of addressed uh, when he gave his speech, uh, when we reviewed his speech. But he didn't go into in a lot of detail about identity and all that. Because uh, So I thought this was a good idea to include that, because this speech just focuses on how company, in a particular example, and how companies are able to capture your data. All that everything you're doing right now, even what we're doing here, is being captured by Google. And they're going to somehow can use this information and target us in a specific way. So it is somewhat scary because these programs are all running on our computer that are just interested in capturing data because that itself is worth more to them than even sometimes the program. So like Google and Facebook and all of these other companies, they are free, but they're not free. The reason they're free is because the information that we are posting, whether it's on Twitter, whether it's uh, YouTube, Facebook, even Google, when we do search, all that information is being used to market to us. So that information is getting captured, and they can pretty much figure out what our purchasing habits are, what our interests are, and that information then can be sold to companies and saying, hey, if you want to sell, uh, uh, let's say, because I like to learn, so they know that my habits are to learn about uh, any educational courses. But they can even specifically pinpoint that the kind of courses that I will probably like would be more in the area of business related, science, things like that, uh, computers, uh, high tech, things like that, and sales, marketing. So they can directly pinpoint what I'm likely to buy. So the companies will then be able to market to me. So anyway, that was the whole point of the speech. And I Overall, what I thought of that speech is uh, I did quite a bit of research on that. I kind of mentioned at the end uh, that I used uh, read two books. Uh, one was a, a book called Power of Habit by Charles Duhigg, and the other one was a book on big data. So out of all that, I condensed it to I think the speech was like less than 10 minutes long. So I included all that and com condensed it into that one and used that initial example to capture audience's attention. And then I explained to them on how they do it. And I used like one of the techniques, correlation. I'm not sure how I, well I did that. Maybe that part needs to be done better. I'll find out from Somin what he thinks. Uh, so anyway, at this point, Somin, I'll hand it off to you to give me your, what, what do you think I did well in that speech? And what are some of the things you think uh, that uh, if I were to re re give that live or re-record it, what, I think, uh, what do you think I need to improve upon? Well, Jay, I, I went through that uh, video. Uh, it was uh, a complimentary uh, thing to the uh, content uh, uh, with uh, Latish discussed uh, the previous week, where he did not give a, a very specific example and discuss that. The, your uh, focus was very much on this uh, um, uh, major example. I also heard of this uh, Target store uh, story, uh, which uh, perhaps first appeared a couple of years back. And that was uh, quite a, a shocking thing to me at that time that people could go and uh, discover so much about uh, individual. Uh, well, I mean, in recent times, I have also done many courses on uh, uh, you know the algorithms for uh, data mining and related things. Uh, more of algorithm courses. I have not done any practicing of data mining, but just generally try to understand what this science is all about. Uh, well, I mean, one can definitely say that these are all covariances, you know, based on which you know they try to understand. Uh, maybe because of the sheer uh, magnitude of uh, data that is there, they uh, are able to find out these kind of insights, which uh, a human would not be able to, you know, uh, so easily uh, decipher. Okay, so that's uh, that's a little uh, interesting. Uh, people can find this kind of uh, uh, covariances and uh, things like that. Uh, definitely, there is also a saying that uh, correlation is not causation. So, uh, you know, there is also another major uh, uh, handicap all this uh, data mining people have. Uh, if uh, my uh, login ID and ticket are used by, by family members who don't really go and, you know, make a separate uh, login account and things like that, and they go and browse when I have logged into a system, uh, to a browser on my, uh, with my login, then, you know, the system could get a very confusing kind of signal. 
okay uh, they will perhaps uh, find that i have logged in but then uh, uh, what i am browsing is not, uh, is not same as you know what my family members are browsing and they can get confused okay so that kind of uh, thing is very much possible so uh, well uh, to the extent that uh, many of us at least in india and all we don't have uh, a personally identifiable ip address doesn't become available to them unless they have put a you know yeah uh, yeah cookie and they, most of these studies have to be based on cookies and as long as we have dynamic ip which is uh, I, I, you know uh, assigned to us every time we log in and that becomes different that also is another factor with which you know people can get confused uh, I, I still feel that notwithstanding this target uh, uh, you know store uh, story uh, online browsing situation is still highly muddled is my thinking target store did not uh, do it based on you know, online study Target store based on based it on whatever was being purchased with a uh, with a, with a particular individual, you know. So to that extent, you know, they were uh, uh, they were looking at the purchase bills and trying to do a correlation. So that I think is very much different. Uh, perhaps that kind of scare in the uh, online browsing environment is a little far away. I think the biggest confounding factor is uh, they really cannot be sure as to who is browsing under whose login. Okay, so that's the problem. Anyway, it uh, still uh, it is uh, perhaps people will figure out uh, some way of you know uh, making sense out of this. Also, they will perhaps dig deeper and new uh, technologies will uh, develop to be able to separate out this uh, uh, mix-ups. Okay, so that that may be another story, new story. I also heard of you know uh, organizations such as uh, you know LinkedIn and uh, 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 Facebook and all, which contain a lot of uh, personal information. Uh, apparently, employees try to uh, find out the, about the, you know, their employees' activities on these uh, uh, websites. Those kind of things seem to be uh, infringing on privacy issues to me much more than uh, uh, what these traders are trying to push. At least the traders are trying to push something which uh, you are likely to buy, buy. There is a correlation and they think that you are going to buy it. So I think that's not so much of a harmful thing. But then if some uh, you know employer is trying to inf infer uh, you know whether I am credit worthy or not based on my friends in Facebook. Then I think that's uh, much more dangerous. I have no control on those kind of situations. Yeah, as far as the the, the speech was concerned, uh, what do you do? You have any specific comments on like certain things? Because again, that was a ten minute speech, and I focused on just that one example and used that as a yeah. way to to raise an issue. Uh, I mean, it wasn't supposed to be comprehensive it was just supposed to be like hey uh, the audience I, I maybe I didn't mention the audience that I was targeting are people who probably didn't know that much about it so this was not geared towards people who are currently working in the big data field this was for people who are like hey I didn't know that companies could do that that every time I'm purchasing I think people today understand this but they don't understand that how much of this information that we are that we're giving away is essentially being used in some ways by these companies to target us in you know not not to use the pun target but they're targeting us uh, as a potential uh, a customer and in this particular example they knew that if you are pregnant then you are at the top because you are going you're going to be really purchasing a lot of things in a short time for the next uh, year or two or even longer and if you can develop they're trying to get you to develop a habit so if they keep sending you these remember this there's a lot of stuff in that uh, that speech that you cannot con cover in 10 minutes but what they're trying to do is that they want you to develop that habit gradually so after a while once you have developed a habit your brain is not even thinking right uh, like ho hopefully we developed a habit of getting on Friday to do the show <laughs> so <laughs> it's Friday comes you're like oh okay I'm gonna go on and do the show that's a habit right and that's what they're doing once they collect the data then they target you and saying oh okay I'm gonna keep sending you this coupon and initially you feel like oh it's a freebie then gradually they'll increase it you're not it's not gonna be free anymore it's gonna be you're gonna pay for it and after a while you're going to purchase more and more before you know it. I mean, I'll give you a perfect example of that is a uh, cell phone. If you look at it, people spend a lot of money on two things that in the old days, they, ne that they didn't spend that much money on. Uh, here in the United States, I don't know about India. India must have something comparable. 
But in America, people spend a lot of money on cable TV. Like I was just talking to my uh, uh, mother the other day, and she has to watch all these programs uh, from India, uh, ZTV or, or all of these programs. I don't even know Sky. I, she's got so many, and her bill per month, from what I get, from what I when I was talking to her, was something like hundred and fifty dollars a month. Okay. Then, so that's just the cable part. Then you take a look at the uh, the smartphone, right? Uh, like an iPhone or an Android. The data part and then apps and all that adds up very quickly to the point that people are spending probably close to, I look at our cell phone bill because all the kids now have their phones. We're spending quite a bit of money every month on that. I think it's about $400 a month when you add up everybody's plan. So uh, the, the part of this is it's, just, it's a habit. Even if you're using it or not, it's just developed into a habit. And these companies know that once they have that habit developed, then that's it. It's, 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 it they, they got you. They got you for, for a long, long time. And it's hard to break that habit. So that's... Uh, uh, that so that's why this this data like somebody would ask like why would they want to go through all this and why would they use all this technology and store all this information and it's because I mean that's one of the reasons why Google is such a profitable company same thing with Amazon I, I mean there's some good side to it but the main thing they're trying to do is they're looking after their interest which is hey I know this guy and I know what he likes if I keep on giving him what he wants, then he'll keep on buying. And after a while, it's such a habit forming that he's not even going to think how much it's really costing him. So. True. That's uh, that's uh, that's the biggest uh, kind of a fallout that can be there. Uh, well, I mean, your speech was uh, good. It's a good informative speech. You talked about this particular case and you focused only on this case. That's perhaps, uh, you, I mean, like uh, Latish tried to cover the entire uh, gamut of uh, data related risk etc you didn't go into the wide range you focus on one particular example and that was a good uh, comprehensive coverage of that particular example so that was uh, uh, you know something that people could understand fully from that video that was good speech okay great so at this point let's close this out and we'll get to segment three okay thanks thanks for your feedback okay. Okay, uh, this is uh, Jay. Hey, can you can you mute your mute your line? Because otherwise, it's switching back and forth. Okay, thanks. Hello, welcome to Speech Talk Live. This is episode number ten, and we're moving to segment number three. And in this segment, we're going to look at a speech given by a famous person. Uh, the person that, that gave the speech, is, his name is Shashi Tharoor, and he's a, a very popular member of the Indian parliament. He's a member of the parliament. And prior to that, I believe, he may have other things he has done. He used to work in the United Nations. Uh, I don't know exactly what his title was. So he's well known. And uh, he has given the speech that I've uh, included uh, and it has to do with, I think it gives us at uh, Oxford. It's an academic setting. And the speech is about reparations. Uh, should Britain you know, owe any kind of reparations to its former colonies for the number of years that they occupied or colonized these nations and, and uh, took away a lot of the wealth uh, from, from these uh, countries? And I thought his speech was excellent. I think uh, he's an excellent speaker. You can tell right away that uh, this is not uh, some amateur. This guy is a real professional when it comes to giving a public speech. And he had it really well organized. And I, here are some of the things that I liked about the speech. Uh, I mean, I don't think there was anything I didn't like about it. It was, the main thing is, it was a fun speech to listen to. And I think, uh, he did that extremely well. He kept that speech uh, very entertaining, and also it was filled with very good content, too. Uh, there was a lot of history involved here. Uh, 
I like the way he started the speech. He injected humor, which I thought was very effective uh, when he says that uh, uh, about a comment about Henry VIII, and you can see the audience laugh. I think once he does that, he pretty much had the audience at that point. So it's a very good technique that we could all learn from on how he starts his speech. Because once you get that done, then you know the rest of it is going to go smoothly. So he essentially had the audience right from the get-go, that joke about Henry VIII. Uh, then he goes into giving all kinds of uh, uh, statistics about how India, before uh, Britain colonialization, was GDP was like 23%, and then after afterwards, after they left, it was 4%. So Indian economy took a big hit from the British rule. And he goes and explains all of these things uh, about all the injustices and, 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 and he gives all the, what he's doing in the speech is like potential objections that people will have. Hey, but you know, you got democracy and he has an answer for that. Hey, uh, what about all the railways that Britain built? And again, he has an answer for that, that all of these were not for India. These were essentially were for Britain. The, the, the railways were not done to benefit the people. It was essentially for the economic interest. So he, then he goes about <clears throat> what India contributed uh, during the uh, occupation or the colonialization, especially the, their contribution during the two wars, World War I and World War II. And, and the whole thing is he goes on and he explains all this in a very uh, content-heavy uh, talk, uh, and he does it in a very... Uh, in a manner that is very easy to listen to because uh, he has a really a, a point of view here that that contrary to what others may think who may have forgotten like hey look how India did so well because of the British uh, rule and he's saying no 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 you're not looking at it the right way let me show you what you're not understanding what it did who knows if that hadn't happened where we would be um, and then again his whole point is that the, the point is not that he's looking for a reparation. He's saying that at least give us an apology for that. You know, <laughs> that first of all, he's trying to convince people that the that the the colonialization colonialization was not a good thing. It was a bad thing, and he's not looking for uh, you know trillions and trillions of dollars. That's going to be hard to quantify at this point. But hey, at least acknowledge that the colonialization. And I'm not sure that is an argument. I don't know, maybe some of you may know more about this, about how people in India. But but one thing I will tell you that the, the, this is nothing to do with the content of it is that he doesn't address some of the other aspect of uh, the colonialization. And again, I don't know whether he had the time, because this is a pretty big topic, is that colonialization was not only the result of Britain. Uh, there was a lot of collusion that took place within India. India was in a disarray because India was not a, a united country. There were a lot of different princely states. So it made it very easy, it easy for, for Britain to colonialize India because India was so divided that it didn't take much for them to pick off each of the princely states and uh, divide the population in such a way that, uh, that they were able to rule for like over 200 years, which is amazing that, that so few people could rule a country for that many years. Uh, uh, because of uh, the way they divided the country. So overall, I thought uh, there's a lot you can learn from this speech. He is uh, directly speaking to the people. He has a very good command of the topic. And he also does it in a, in a manner that you can tell that this person is a very polished speaker. So overall, I thought uh, it was an excellent speech. And uh, and at the end afterwards, uh, I, I'll tell you the difference that I see between uh, that speech was a very British speech. And I will compare and contrast that with a typical American speech. So I'll, 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 I'll let you do, let me know what you thought of this and then. Yeah, uh, uh, see, I, I just uh, also went through this uh, speech and uh, I also uh, made some uh, uh, search for some more references, etc. Uh, Sashi Tharoor actually was Under Secretary General 
uh, in the iterations. He contested for the post of Secretary General against uh, Ban Ki Moon, and finally Ban Ki Moon uh, won the election and he lost it. After he lost it, he uh, left the uh, UN and came back to India and joined politics. Okay, so that's uh, political uh, history. Uh, second is uh, on this uh, uh, video itself. This video went viral, and uh, within three weeks, it touched 2.8 billion views. Okay, so uh, under in the Oxford Union Society, Oxford Union Society is uh, a debating society. In that, they have something like 20 million views totally. They have listed the top five videos which have uh, logged about 1.8 million or uh, more. Some of them have been uh, there for nearly two years. But this is the one which touched 2.8 billion and stands at the number one ranking. Uh, and it has reached that within three weeks. So that is some sort of a record for them, it looks. Okay, that's one. Then, uh, you know, uh, uh, this was a debate. Apparently, a number of speakers were there. Uh, Sashitru says that he is uh, the seventh speaker, the last speaker in this uh, lot. And so uh, when he comes in as a last person, there's going to be uh, perhaps a certain amount of pity with the audience. There's perhaps going to be some amount of, uh, uh, you know, points being repeated by many people. And he also has the responsibility to do rebuttal to many of the other previous speakers. So that really makes this an uh, impromptu speech. He is not only, you know, talking about a subject that has been given to him, but also, you know, referring to some points which are uh, mentioned by the some of the producers and trying to use that to you know make a counterpoint and you know and uh, uh, bring about a conclusion if he's the last speaker for his team you know there are two uh, people who are divided so those who say yes and those who say no and for his team uh, it is almost like the you know in a sprint uh, team the last guy is the one who is going to do the finishing so he comes in like a finisher and finishes it beautifully so that's a, a kind of role he has played and what happened to the result uh, in a separate interview, uh, which is not there as part of this video, it's a uh, given to a TV channel in India. He has said that they won 189 to 56. So 189 said yes, and 56 said uh, uh, no. Okay, so that that means 189 people agreed. Yes, reparations uh, uh, should be given. Okay, at least it must be acknowledged that that reparations are uh, are uh, are a you know fair demand. Okay, that kind of uh, conclusion. Uh, well, that's uh, that's about it. Uh, well, well, talking about the other thing, I was a little surprised that uh, uh, every time I see these uh, uh, statistics that you know India had some 33 percent of uh, world trade uh, in the earlier era, that uh, somehow looks a little you know uh, unbelievable to me. Now, for one, you know India was never a single uh, country. I don't think that would have been any statistics, etc. It was hundreds of princely states. So uh, if somebody were to say India had a certain amount of trade, they have to agglomerate all this and then talk about trade. Okay, so uh, that there would have been a lot of trade within these princely states also. You need to counter them, I mean, um, uh, you know, uh, direct them and to say what went outside this group. M more like, you know, what is the trade between European Union and other, uh, uh, you know, countries without counting intra-European Union trade. Okay, so it's a fairly challenging thing. Uh, fine, uh, notwithstanding that in the early days, uh, you know, uh, there was uh, perhaps a lot more of uh, 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 demand for spices and things like that. Perhaps the traditional, uh, uh, you know, uh, world trade toppers of today, such as, you know, petroleum and electronics and things like that were not the biggest commodities in those days. It was uh, perhaps uh, textiles and uh, uh, and the spices and things like that, which perhaps was uh, yeah, a thing that gave India edge at that time. So that's one observation I have. Then uh, he had about eight minutes to talk, but he actually took about 15 minutes. The video is about 15 minutes long. So obviously, uh, everybody around the world has the same problem. They have a targeted time, but then they exceed it. Uh, since he uh, you know, came in as a last speaker and had to do a lot of rebuttal, I think that was allowed. There was not much of a discussion on that. Nobody seems to uh, you know, ring a bell and try to stop him. Uh, well, I mean, practically everybody in that uh, talk, I mean, I watched many other uh, talks of uh, this Oxford the Union Society also, and many of these people use uh, you know handwritten notes and they practically carry this with them. They don't seem to uh, bother about memorizing because it's such an impromptu speech. In the last minute, people jot down points. They don't have enough time to memorize. They don't, really don't want to get into that kind of mess. So they do carry a, a slip of paper and write down their points in their hand. Now, this is something that many people who know who say that they forgot a point or whatever it is, or uh, they, they feel a little hesitant about carrying a note or something like that. They can uh, draw some kind of uh, uh, you know consolation from. Uh, then, uh, of course, uh, he he did a little bit of uh, uh, 
you know, uh, this is more like a persuasive speech. Uh, so I, I would say a lot of linguistic jugglery was also done. Uh, there are some amount of ad hominem also I could see. Uh, for example, you know, he tried to uh, take a dig saying that if the sun doesn't set on the British Empire, it is because the God himself does not uh, believe the Britishers. You know, uh, to say that uh, uh, they uh, did a loot for of this country and uh, God did not believe them in the dark. Something like that. So that is anyway hit below the belt kind of uh, allegation. There is no uh, established proof. These are all ling linguistic uh, um, ways of trying to uh, establish a point. Okay. So he did a quite a few of these kind of jibes. Okay. So um, that's uh, 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 that is something. Finally, uh, you know, this had a lot of impact in India. Uh, there was, uh, you know, uh, perhaps this uh, thing went viral because. Uh, among Indians, this was a very popular thing where people were, uh, you know, uh, uh, sharing it with other, their friends and others. Uh, then uh, the prime minister of the country, uh, Narendra Modi, uh, who belongs to another party, uh, which is, you know, uh, opposed to Sashi Tharoor's uh, party, you know, they, they are not loggerheads, but still, uh, Narendra Modi had a lot of uh, things to praise uh, Sashi Tharoor for this speech. Uh, he, he made a very particular mention about. Uh, uh, this speech by Sashi Thrur and uh, congratulated him. So that is a very uh, odd event for Indian politicians to do to their you know, uh, counterparts, and, I mean, to their uh, political uh, enemies. Okay, so that's uh, one key factor. Uh, Sashi Thrur himself uh, uh, attributed this popularity of this talk to uh, the the national uh, nationalism, which it uh, touched upon, you know, but practically all Indians irrespective of the party, uh, this appeal because it appealed to the nationalism and not to any other political ideology. Okay, so that was another uh, key point. Uh, Sashitharur also made one, yet another observation in that interview. He said that uh, after the talk was over, uh, there are many opponents, you know, who publicly had taken a different position on this uh, subject. Uh, you know, they called him up and talked to him and congratulated him. And he said, look, I must uh, uh, say, I must uh, confess and acknowledge that, uh, you know, what I call as uh, the uh, British sense of fair play was very much in evidence. And a lot of these people, uh, you know, uh, even though they have taken a public posture of a different nature, they did congratulate him and they did acknowledge uh, what he said was uh, a very fair thing to ask. OK, so that's something that uh, he, he mentioned. Um, well, I mean, this uh, speech suddenly became uh, quite uh, popular and viral. But uh, one interesting factor was Sashitra himself did not think that uh, this was his best speech. Apparently, he says, look, I made another speech in the Indian parliament on uh, juvenile uh, uh, justice. OK, so that is something I uh, thought was a much more passionate speech where I did a much better job. But then that did not even get you know uh, any views or any comments, not even in parliament. It was sort of. Uh, just another speech that was made and everybody seemed to really know the media did not latch on to it nothing happened to it okay so he, his disappointment was there is a better speech that he gave but then it went unrecognized because the forum was uh, uh, yeah, indian parliament where and uh, nobody really seemed to uh, you know may, may make much uh, out of that so these are the other additional observations i have to say about this particular video yeah, the the last point uh, I'll I'll comment on that when he said that he didn't think this was his best speech. Uh, I I think your speech is really the metrics is not determined by you; it's determined by your audience, right? So if this one touched, uh, you mentioned two point, he has had two point eight million views. The audience is saying that we were moved by how many? 2.8, right? Okay. 2.8 million. Yeah, so 2.8 million is a lot, right? Because an average YouTube video will not even get it. If you get 1,000 views, that's considered really good. So uh, I haven't got any of my video to even get close to 100 yet. One is close, 92 or something. But 100 is good, but 1,000 is even better. But that's it. Most of them, if you ever check it, the popular ones kind of spoil you, right? Like they get millions and 20 millions, 100 million, billion, whatever. Those are rare. Those are like real viral. And if you got 2.8 million, that means that based on just that the number of views, this speech really hit a nerve. It, it, it resonated with the people. So when he says that his best speech nobody even cared about, well, that just goes to show that that maybe that speech 
he's trying he liked it because he he's showing how smart he is this speech is basically he's showing to the he's making us smarter about understanding this issue in in a way that many of us probably didn't understand it hey there is a lot here about the colonialism and the injustice and the economic uh, 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 you know destruction economic destruction that took place during the colonial rule and uh, but many probably didn't know that and I think that's why this the, the point I'm making is that when you give a speech it's not whether you like it it's what the audience likes that's the one that you're not giving a speech for yourself otherwise just record it and just keep watching it once you put it out there, it's the audience that 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 counts. So, when he says that he's got other speech that were better, I think that's that, that's not that comment doesn't go anywhere because the purpose of a speech is not for you; it's for your audience. Um, the the other thing is, I mean, he's a very accomplished speaker. Obviously, he's very well educated, and uh, he. I'll, I'll touch upon one thing. This is something that I noticed uh, between, uh, and it's a matter of style, but it's a very important point. I kind of look at Modi as a, a a speaker in the mold of an American speaker. Modi is more like an American speaker. The Sashi Tharoor speech comes across like he's a traditional British speaker. Like this is what a British speaker would look like. If you want to say, okay, what would a typical British speaker speech would look like? Outstanding British speech. I would put Sashi Tharoor. Modi's speech is very much like an American speech. And the reason is that an American speakers like Reagan and Lincoln, and even if you go back even farther, Benjamin Franklin, they use a lot of this uh, homespun logic, uh, like stories. They're very much into parables and stories to make a larger point. That's the style. That's the typical American style of speaking. Uh, I didn't see any of that in this speech. This speech was just simply facts presented in a very clever and uh, insightful way. And there were a lot of, like you said, that there, there are quotes throughout. Like he said, we paid for our own oppression. I, very effective. Then I think this one you mentioned, and then he also had Churchill wrote something down about Gandhi. Why hasn't Gandhi died yet? Very effective. Then the one that you pointed out about uh, why the sun doesn't set, he said, God couldn't trust the English in the dark very effective. So he had all of these in there. The thing, and it's very effective, but when I'm, when I'm comparing that to if an American speaker gave a speech, like let's say Ronald Reagan, he would have a parable. That's how his style was. And the purpose of it was that he wanted, he wanted to touch the person at the, the common denominator was much lower. He would not put a lot of the facts and stuff. There would be enough facts, but that's not what would win the day. It would be these simple stories, parables that had to support the larger message. So I just wanted to kind of point that out, that that it's a matter of style and not saying that one is good over the other. You've got to know your audience. That's the key. So even when you're speaking, this is just maybe for your point, if you're speaking to an American audience, you want to come up, come up with a story that that it's so general that it'll resonate and then make your larger point around that one story then americans get it quickly and again i there was an article i point that was harvard business review and this is a very important point you know we don't we all think like that because i'm giving a speech it's going to work in every setting it doesn't the way americans follow a speech is uh, it's like get to the main point and then that's it get to the main point right but if you're speaking to a uh, let's say a european audience you can't get to the main point right away you have to build it up logically it's x y z oh now this is why that that's how they are taught that's how they're brought up if you just get to the main point and saying well, let me just get you to the main point and then that's it. They're going to be disappointed. That's not how, that's not what they're used to. So there was an, uh, a book written by this woman. She's a professor. I forgot her name. I, I'll include that. And, uh, and also she had written an article in Harvard Business Review. <coughs> and she was pointing that out, that a lot of businessmen who 
from America when they go to Europe, let's say France or maybe Russia, if their speech is not specifically adapted to that environment, to that setting, that speech will come across as like, wait a second, you just made a big point, but he never explained how he got to that. It doesn't work there. In America, similarly, if a, a European came to America and started going on and saying, okay, let me start with this, let me start, it, then they're going to get bored very quickly. They have to understand how the American mind thinks, uh, processes information. And similarly, we also need to understand how the European and Asian mind processes information. And it's not the same. And that's one of the things that, uh, that, that people... Like, if you listen to Shashi Tharoor's speech, he's building an argument. You see that? He's building an argument. Like, here's what happened. Here's what happened. Here's World War One. Here's World War Two. Here's what happened, uh, what, what Churchill did to Gandhi. There's like a clear, if this speech was given by, a, let's say, a similar experience in America, because we have the same issue here, right, with African Americans. They're also saying, hey, there should be reparations. There are always arguments going back and forth. And that argument is going to be given much differently than the way uh, same speaker, let's say Sashi Tharoor were to come to America and give a speech about the American experience around slavery, the way he's given that speech would not work effectively in an American setting, American audience. American audience would, would tell him like that slavery was bad because of look at what's happening now. And then he may have to go into a little bit more detail. The main point had to be brought up right in the beginning. And, and that and it's a, so something which we can discuss at a, another time on on how to organize the speech for the audience for the country that in which you're giving that speech in. It's not the same. So uh, so overall, I thought this was uh, I, I learned a lot. It's, I'm going to go and watch it again. If there was an entire program, if you have a link for that, I'd like to see the entire debate because all I got to see was just the the Sashi Tharoor's part only. I didn't get to see what the other speakers had said. Yeah, in, in fact, I went to the Oxford Union uh, Society website uh, just to be able to uh, uh, see whether I can see other videos. Unfortunately, it was not there, uh, or at least I could not search for it effectively. Uh, I mean, anything that has been spoken there, I think, must have had a, a recording. Uh, in uh, in our discussion column, somebody had even asked, uh, but then there was no response to that uh, question. Uh, so it would have been interesting to see what the other, all the seven people uh, spoke about in this uh, in this subject. Okay, all right. I think that's uh, closes it out. So I'll just take a brief pause and then we'll close out this uh, this uh, uh, show. Okay. Yeah. Thank you. Bye. All right. So we're done. Any any closing comments? Yeah. Today was. Uh, I mean, we had some uh, three interesting uh, subjects. Uh, I think uh, the Sashita Road uh, talk was something that. Uh, uh, you know, I, I had a lot more notes, but then, <laughs> you know, I, I thought it is not possible to get into each and every point and discuss. So he definitely made a fa fantastic speech. Uh, I, I think this speech was the highlight of the day, and uh, well, uh, it was another yeah, good day. When I, when I post it, you can, you, yeah, when I post it, if you want to add more comments to it, that's one of the things I do once I post it. If you want to continue the discussion, then just go and add uh, some of the comments that you didn't get a chance to. No, I would uh, do that. I would do that. Okay. I would do that. All right. Uh, next week, we'll look at Julie's speech. I told her that what she has is enough right now. Don't spend too much time. So we'll uh, review her speech. All right. Uh, I'll talk to Marie and I'll let you know what I find out. Okay. Okay. Bye. Bye. Good night. Good night.